States Navy submarine, Silversides. The commander is named Coy. And in this episode, over several days, Coy will track one or two or perhaps the same of the Japanese convoys from the point of view of a commander of a submarine. He will do this exhaustingly. He will exhaust himself. He will exhaust his crew, about 80, 87 men on board. This episode is not just about the drama of one hunt or the, or the escorts with their, with, their, uh, with their depth charges coming at you. This is about the perseverance of the United States Navy Submarine Service illustrated in a comprehensive story, a new book, the War Below, the story of three submarines that battled Japan. James Scott is the author. James, a very good evening to you. And a major thing I've learned from you is that each of these submarines, the lost and the surviving and their crews, all have libraries and museums and uh, families and grandchildren, all of whom share correspondence and uh, continue to this day to detail all of the cruises of these submarines. Is that correct? Absolutely, John, and thanks for having me on with you uh, this evening. It's a real pleasure to uh, to join you. They do, actually, and in fact, the drum, one of the submarines that I wrote about, actually had a reunion this summer, in fact, down in uh, Mobile, Alabama, where the, uh, the submarine is now a museum there. So uh, certainly in the case with so many World War II veterans who are sadly passing away uh, every single day, uh, a lot of their families, particularly their children and even grandchildren, are really picking up the torch, if you will, and uh, and uh, and trying to help promote those stories, uh, gather up those important artifacts, those letters, those uh, those diaries, and uh, and making make them available to folks like myself who want to tell those stories. So, uh, James uh, has been very careful here. All of the details, all of the footnotes, every person lost or still alive. You know, you're telling a war story. It's from many points yeah. of view, and the captain only sees what he can from the conning tower, from the periscope. But the men in the torpedo rooms, the uh, the chief officers, and onshore and offshore. So let's go to aboard Silverside. What do we need to know about uh, the commander of this aircraft uh, of this submarine, Coy? Jack, Jack Coy was a uh, <clears throat> Jack Coy really had his work cut out for him. He had taken over. Uh, as the second skipper of the Silver Sides, uh, following an incredibly successful first skipper, uh, a gentleman by the name of Creed Burlingame, who had uh, gone on to win three Navy crosses. He had uh, he destroyed a, a confirmed eight Japanese ships, and he was incredibly loved by his uh, by his men. Uh, they had survived uh, depth charges. Uh, they had survived uh, gun battles, and a, even an emergency appendectomy at sea. And so it was a really uh, Coy had big boots to fill, if you will, when he took over uh, following Creed. Uh, and, Coy, uh, was, Coy was a Naval Academy 1929. I'm struck by almost every yep. commander or even executive officer. They're, in, uh, they're Annapolis graduates. Was that the submarine service right away? They were only going to give it to Annapolis men. Early in the war, it was. Uh, and you have to remember so many of these guys had come through, and they were career naval officers. And the submarine, uh, the submarine service was really small. Uh, in fact, there would only be 465 skippers throughout the entire war, and so it's a really, really small, uh, small service. In fact, the entire submarine service would represent only 1.6 percent of the entire Navy, and so most of those leaders were, uh, particularly early in the war, were all Naval Academy graduates. Uh, and most of the officers were as well. Later in the war, you know, once uh, enlistments had gone up and, and draft and things of that nature, you would see more and more people who would come in who had not gone through uh, the Naval Academy who would be uh, rising up those ranks. But early in the war, uh, that was very much the case. Let me correct the record right away. Coy entered the Naval Academy in 29. He's the class of 33. And, class of 33, yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 Jack, and, and, and the, the question here about Jack Coy is about his service once he's at that periscope. So yeah. we can talk about how they thought of him in the lucky bag. That's the Naval Academy uh, graduation book where they write you up and you have a nickname. His nickname was Decoy. But let's go to, <laughs> let's go to sea with him. He he's, yeah. he has a high performance uh, submarine, and mm-hmm. he's tracking a convoy. It's not yeah. very large; it's maybe five or six ships. How yeah. does he track it? What what weapon? What tools does he have to know where the convoy is, is on the surface, or even when he's on the surface at night? Well, that's the thing that's so fascinating about this. I mean, Coy, uh, he would have this great line uh, that he would say later on in life. He would say, I always used to save the coal burners for last. And by, and by that, he's talking about the type of fuel a ship used. Uh, instead of the diesel, for instance, they were burning coal. 
you know, and so he would say, I would say the coal burners flats because they would put out this really dark black smoke that you could see for miles. And so when a submarine is running on the surface, they would have lookouts and they would climb up into, uh, up, up high into these perches on the uh, top of the conning tower with binoculars, and they would scan the horizons and they would look for. Uh, a, a cloud that could possibly be smoke, any kind of silhouette, uh, anything like that that might give them away. They would also at times look for uh, aircraft that might indicate a uh, patrol plane that might be covering if they're near an island or something that might be providing protection. So they're looking is everywhere they can. And, of course, they had, uh, they had radar, which would become much more sophisticated later in the war as, as well. But, uh, but that's what they were doing. They were out searching, uh, trying to find Japanese ships. Uh, and they had one mission, sink them. I mean, that right. was really – they, these were absolutely – they were weapons of war, and their whole uh, their whole mission was to put ships on the bottom. 24 torpedoes, and we'll flag yep. a significant detail about the torpedoes. They're, all, they're, they're intercepting convoys between Rabol, which is the yeah. Japanese headquarter for the South Pacific. That's their fortress. Yeah. And truck at the time – this is October of 43. They join in a hunt because another submarine, the Baleo – is that how you say it? Baleo. The Baleo. The Baleo. Yep. The Baleo, the Baleo had got there first. The yeah. Baleo fires its uh, torpedoes, and they miss or are yeah. not successful, and the escort vehicles then turn for the Baleo, and Koi, yeah. very aggressive, then takes advantage of that. What does he do? Absolutely. It goes in and starts the attack, and that's, that's, that's the beauty of one of the things that the submarines uh, could do at that point is, you know, they, they were always at risk of these escort ships that were with the Japanese uh, convoys that they would come in and they would drop depth charges. And so, it, you know, if the Baleo is unsuccessful on an attack, all the escorts then, they can trace back to where a shot came from by sort of looking at where it would hit or listening to sonar and things like that, trace back. And so they're going to spend their their time going after the Baleo. And then at that point then, the, uh, the Silver Sides, no one knows it's there, can then sneak in and make its own attack. And so the, the Navy would use this tactic uh, later in the war, too. And they called them wolf packs, actually, and they would use multiple submarines mm-hmm. hunting together, just like wolves. And, and, and they would use them to great effect later in the war and be able to devastate entire convoys that way. Uh, Koi waits all night because it's a very yeah. bright moon. At 5.35 a.m., the convoy yeah. zigs the wrong way. They're always zigzagging, and they can get away from him, and he has a perfect shot at the yeah. Taran Maru. What yeah. is he firing? How oft, How many torpedoes would he use on a 1,915-ton tr- freighter? It, you know, it, it depends. I mean, what he's really going to want to do in a situation like that is he's going to try to say, all right, he's going to, he wants to make sure he gets his hits in, and so he's going to spread his torpedoes across the totality of the ship, you know. And they were using uh, the technology at that time. They had what was called a, a torpedo data computer, which was a, an analog computer, if you will, that would sort of help them in sort of setting up their shot. And But they, they used that to be able to – uh, sort of compute the trigonometry because you have to remember, you know, these boats are moving. There's a great distance between them. You know, you're trying to figure out your uh, how fast they're going, how fast you're going. I mean, it's, there's a lot of sort of arithmetic involved, and so they would figure that out, and then they would they would sort of bracket their shots in such a way where you could guarantee, you know, you would send several shots and then guarantee that at least one of them would be a great, that one of them would hit or two of them would hit and also be able to cause the most destruction possible. The Tarin Maru goes down yeah. and they recover yeah. some of its debris. They lose a tr- uh, they lose contact with the Baleo. And what is striking about this, and it goes over several pages, is that the two continue together on and off meeting at sea and they yeah. track convoys for days. It's a tireless yeah. pursuit in which they are always at risk because they don't know when an aircraft is going to come out of nowhere and spot them or uh, an escort vehicles are going to turn on them. And it wears down the crew and it wears down Koi. And one of the things I get from your book, James, is not everybody's yeah. for the silent service. They don't know until you're down in a submarine about yeah. to be depth charged whether you belong there or not. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, and, that, and that's the thing. It's, it, you know, they tried, uh, it, it's funny, in, in the Navy as far as trying to sort of determine who was best cut out for it because it was a very, I mean, the submarine service was a very, submarine life was a very austere life. I mean, when they put to sea, you know, they were designed to go out uh, for as much as 90 days at a time. You would go, uh, if you were leaving Hawaii and you were steaming, for instance, or cruising all the way to Japan and back, I mean, you're looking at, you know, almost two weeks to get there, two weeks back, and then you're so you're, you're living off of canned goods, and uh, for some of these folks, particularly, you know, engine men and stuff who were 
they may not see sunlight for that entire time if they're not on lookout or they don't have a reason to go topside. And so, you know, you're living in a, in a, in a, in a tube that is essentially you know, a little over 300 feet long and 27 feet wide. Um, bunks are stacked three high. Uh, it's, a, it's a very tough existence. And so one of the best ways they had to sort of determine who was cut out for it or not, one of the tests they used was a, uh, was a diving tower. And it was 100 feet of water. And they would put people in there and they would test how, you know, it simulate, if you will, escape from a stricken submarine. And they use that as sort of the psychological test. If you could handle that, they figured then you were strong enough to be able to handle uh, life in the silent service. But even then, not everybody was a, I mean, people cracked. Things, uh, people wore out. I mean, it was a, uh, you know, they would go out for, you know, two, three months at a time. They would come back. They would get a couple weeks off, and they would go right back out again. And so, uh, and, you know, even though the Navy had a policy of trying to rotate uh Crew members, after a few patrols and skippers, would serve no more than five in a row. Uh, you know, there were exceptions to those rules. Uh, let's uh, let's meet one of the uh, most successful yeah. of all commanders when we come back. O'Kane of the Tang. Yeah. The book is The War Below, the story of three submarines that battled Japan. We've met the Silver Sides with Koi. Now we're going to meet the Tang. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. <laughs> 